Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. Today I'm joined by the CEO of MDT, makers of fine firearms accessories and rifle chassis. Welcome to the Silver Core Podcast, Martin Van Reitenberg. Thank you for having me. Martin, I'm really excited to have you on the podcast. It's I've been watching MDT grow for a very long time now, and you guys are, it, it appears from your social media anyways, you're in a stage of even greater expansion. Looks like you're getting into a new building and maybe some new things coming down the pipe that we might be able to talk about. But before we go there, I kind of want to get a little bit of background for myself and for the listeners on, on you and kind of how you came into MDT. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I came into MDT in 2012, late 2012. It was a kind of an interesting time. Um, I was a supply chain manager back then in Chilliwack at a company that was bought out by a company in California and it was a big management change and I was out of work. Mm. Um, I'd always been somewhat entrepreneurial, always been looking at creating my own businesses and getting involved. And somebody connected me with, uh, Laszlo Clementis. Uh, yes, I know Laszlo. Yeah, you know, a lot of people locally here will know him. He was quite active in the shooting community, especially back then. Yep. Today he seems to be busy with having kids and stuff. Um, but, um, I was introduced to him and he was already making the TAC-21 chassis, which he started designing around 2009. That's right. That's right. The MDT TAC-21. That was the very first flagship that, that came out, wasn't it? That's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. So when I was asked to, uh, work with them, I said, now oh, give me some time. I'll look online and see what people are saying about this and see if there's anything to it. And I looked online and there was a lot of people just very stoked about it. I think, especially on Canadian gun nuts, people were like, I want one, I want one. And I think right. he had a list of some 80 people that wanted one when he had just posted a prototype picture. I remember that. Yeah. And, uh, so, so that looked very exciting. And, uh, I actually started working for MDT as a contractor to see if I could do something. Uh, I went to SHOT Show, worked hard, got, I believe I walked away with 750 business cards at that SHOT Show. So that would have been January, 2013. So, and, so what, what were you doing as a contractor? Uh, uh, sales and marketing. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I realized that, um, a lot of things needed to happen at the company in order to like, you, you can sell something, but when you can't ship it in time, it's, you know, it's not, not a lot of fun to sell something. <laughs> yes. uh, so, you know, a, a quick version of it was that I ended up buying half the company from Laszlo back then. And so we ran a company together, 50, 50 partners for uh, quite a number of years until 2017 when he was bought out by a private equity firm. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so that's how, uh, how I got involved with MDT. So I'm not the founder, Laszlo is. Right. Um, so I have run the company as the CEO since 2013. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, all the product development, all the product design, everything that happens there, it's, uh, Laszlo and, uh, today a group of eight designers and engineers that are constantly working on new products. Well, I've, I've always known Laszlo as a very talented machinist mm -hmm. and somebody who's got lots of ideas. And I remember around 2002, 2003, I think it was, he was going by the name of Rooster 33 on Canadian gun nuts and he's selling M14 cheek pieces and muzzle brakes. And I remember I had moved out into uh, a rental place at that time with my wife and the place was just an absolute dump, just a terrible place, but I had a big backyard and I, and I had a shop. And so there was a shop that I was interested in because at the time it was not silver core training. I did the training, but I had silver core gun works and Laszlo would come by with different muzzle brakes or uh, little screws that he's making up and I'd be parkerizing them for him. But 
I remember watching as the, uh, the whole chassis thing started coming to fruition. And I also remember watching a lot of people in the gun community kind of sit down and back and trying to take credit for giving the idea to Laszlo for doing this, whether that's true or not, he was a guy who really pushed it forward. Yeah, that's right. He's the guy that made it happen. And the reason it was called TAC-21 is because it was 21 versions on paper before it became an actual product. See, I didn't know that. It's yeah. kind of like WD-40. <laughs> now we got TAC-21. Interesting. Yeah. So the, the whole chassis idea for some of the listeners, they're, they're going to know exactly what we're talking about, but can you describe the concept behind the chassis and, you know, side question, I'm wondering, uh, how long have chassis really been around for? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the original chassis would have come from, uh, Accuracy International. Right. Um, Laszlo actually, when he started working on a chassis, he wanted to buy one, but he couldn't afford one. Mm. And that's when he started looking at m making something since he is a machinist by trade. Right. And, um, he wanted to design something that was, uh, more ergonomic and natural to somebody that came maybe out of military and was used to like an AR platform. So he wanted to do the pistol grip and he wanted to use AR butt stocks. That was a very important part for him. Right. And, uh, and we, you know, that made it a modular system where you could swap grips out and butt stocks and, and we still pride ourselves today on the majority of our products being very modular and. And, and build it and swap it exactly to how you would want it. Right. So the, I guess I remember, so Accuracy International, they started their AICS, actually Accuracy International chassis system, mm -hmm. and they would glue their receiver right into the chassis. And they say, this makes a superior, stronger product. I think that's been tested and debated. I believe they still glue it, don't they? I don't know what they still do, but that is an, it's an interesting question. And we deal with that a lot. If yeah. People should be bedding and gluing and all that kind of stuff. Um, I still have a, uh, a rifle at home in attack 21, one of the originals. So, uh, Laszlo had gotten two identical receivers, identical barrels, you know, shooting with them, make sure that they had, uh, very closely to the same, uh, results when shooting them. And he put them in the exact same chassis, one glued and one not glued. And that, so both those rifles still exist today. Okay. And, uh we have never been able to notice a difference between in performance between the two. And it makes sense because, uh, the way that the, all our chassis are designed is the round action always sits in a V block. Right. It, you know, you do have to pay attention to look where the V is in the, in the block, but it has nowhere to go when it's screwed in properly. Right. And, um, it, it, it since it cannot move glued or not, there should not be any difference in performance. And I guess the, cause I remember when they started coming out with aluminum V blocks and they're putting them in stocks and they say, this is the latest, greatest, you no longer have to bet it anymore. We've got this aluminum V block system, but the chassis will take that one step further and it's all going to be uh, integral to the chassis. Will it? It's all going to be one solid as opposed to uh, a stock that's been carved out and then you kind of screw one in. Is that, is that the concept? Yeah, definitely with the TAC-21. Uh, our other chassis would be very similar, but yeah, it, it sucks that action tight into that entire chassis and, um, it, it essentially becomes one with it. Um, so with the TAC-21, then it also has that housing, which has the rail built in. And we see comments or people like, I would never have the rail be part of the chassis rather than being directly on the receiver. Mm. But again, it, um, th there is no changes in accuracy. And as a matter of fact, it is actually a more solid system because that rail just simply has nowhere to go. It's not connected by a couple of screws. It's literally machined right in. And, uh, so, I mean, like you can't argue with having a rail machined right into the action itself, right? but, but this will be the next best thing. No kidding. So, okay. So you came in and said, I, I, did you have a background in firearms before this? I did not have a uh, background in firearms before this. No. When I got involved, uh, I had never shot a center fire before. I had shot some other stuff before. And, um, so I had to learn rapidly. Well, I see your name on a lot of different, uh, lists, competitive lists, PRS style matches. You're the CEO of a company and you want to be out there shooting on a regular basis. Yeah. So I, I do, okay. um, I don't, uh. I mean, I can't pretend that I have all the answers because how could I, I, I wasn't even shooting, you know, 10 years ago. Right. Uh, so what's the best way for us? And this is not just me. This is 
we encourage everybody else at the company to do the same. How could we how could we say we're going to come up with all these great products if we're not out there shooting? Mm. So all our employees get a monthly a- uh, ammo allowance. Right. Um, we do th- things. We pay for their match fees. We want to make sure that everybody goes out and shoot. So it does so many things. It, it well, going out to shoot, you can see what the pain points are. You can mm-hmm. you come up with new products, but you also talk to the community. Uh, and it's the same thing for me personally. Um, I like to be out there talking to our customers, potential customers, mm. competitors, whatever. I have good relationships with a lot of our competitors. Um, and I want to better myself at the same time. I'm, I want to learn. When I just started uh, shooting some of the matches, it was um, – I just wanted to, you know, just be there. And then I was like, okay, I want to be coming at least top half. And then I started shooting some matches. I would come in top five, Ooh. a couple. And I was like, mm, I got to do more. So I spent quite a bit of time uh, really figuring out what I got to do. I spent a fair amount of time with uh, Ryan Stacy, who I believe is a phenomenal teacher. Mm-hmm. And uh, he helped me a lot with the mental game. Uh, Raul Verzosa, he's still closely collect- connected to uh, MDT. He's helped me a ton. Mm. Uh, we actually shot a video of one of the uh, matches that I shot last year and some of the, the training that went into it ahead of time. Um, but I just love doing it and I love to go out different places. So I've shot matches locally here. I've shot one of the guardian matches in Ireland. I've shot some in the U S uh, I would have already shot some matches in Australia and, uh, South Africa, but then COVID hit Right. And, uh, that, that's kind of yeah. cut that down, but that's still in the plans. Um, uh, I, I don't have an objective to be coming in number, you know, first because mm. the amount of time that I would have to dedicate to that would probably or maybe hurt the business. Right. Um, but um, I love doing it. I love being there. And I, uh, you know, I think that all of us should always work on bettering ourselves. I 100% agree. You know, it's funny. I was uh, out in the foreshore doing some hunting last night. And I thought, you know, while I'm doing a little bit of research for this podcast, maybe we'll just, I'll, I'll reach out to Laszlo and I'll reach out to Ryan. I'll see what kind of dirt I can get on you and what kind of informa- information they can provide. No dirt. They have no dirt on you. <laughs> Either that or they keep it a pretty, pretty to themselves. But, uh, Ryan was talking about your, um, your mental management in the, uh, in the PRS style shooting that you're doing and how far you've come with that, which is, um, which is pretty inspirational for somebody who's building a business such as yours and expanding the business to still be able to have the time to, I think they call it the hook where you're taking care of all the stuff at the top, but you're still able to hook down and use all the products at the, the end user level, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it is cool. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't have any dirt on, uh, on, <laughs> on me, but, <laughs> but you know, uh, personally, but as a company as well, we try to be extremely transparent in everything that we do. And, uh, you know, we screw up from time to time and, and we, we try to be as open as we possibly can. So there really shouldn't be dirt out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, there wasn't, there wasn't anything. And the other thing that's really cool is how you can, a lot of times when people get into business together, that's a very stressful situation. And that, those stresses can introduce animosity between partners. And I'm not picking up on any of that. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It looks like you've been able to grow the company and, uh, build MDT to where it is now with the help of what At- Laszlo had built in the past. And you guys are still quite quite close, which is very, uh, very inspirational. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and again, it comes with the transparency, right? So I'm clear with what I want to do and where I want to go. And if I don't do things with hidden motions, I think that the animosity sh- that should almost get rid of it. Um, mm. so, you know, I can't say that there haven't been, you know, moments where, you know, like any partnership that things are kind of, you know, uh, you disagree on things and all that, but sure. yeah, no, we still get along great. Laszlo and I still have lunch together from time to time. Not anymore because, you know, something is keeping us out of restaurants, but, um. <laughs> that's something. Yeah. That, that's something that's probably helping with sales. Uh, I would think it has COVID, uh, yeah. positively affected the, uh, the yeah, sales. A- yeah, absolutely. Uh, in 2020, yeah, 2020, our sales, uh, increased by a significant amount. And then this, this past year again, um, We don't really uh, know what part of it is just simply, you know, our brand growing and our our new product creation. Mm. uh, And so how much of it really is COVID related with the exception, if we look at a couple of spikes that we saw, especially in 2020, those were at the exact same dates that people were receiving stimulus checks. So we do know there is at least some. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well spent stimulus check. Yeah. I yeah. love it. Yeah. I, I was pretty amazed at the, uh, the increase in interest in not just the outdoors community and being outdoors, obviously when things are locked down, people want to be outside, but the interest in self-sufficiency. And I think for some people, there's a level of fear associated that they figure that maybe firearms can help allay those fear, fears and Canada is sort of a different culture, but it's not immune to it than let's say in the United States, but it's encouraging to know that if that is a motivator behind it, that it expands past just, Hey, I, I got to get me a gun. It's, I actually want to go out there and get something that's quality. I want to get something I've, I've got a genuine genuine interest in this new endeavor that I'm getting into. Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting, uh, point, especially on the safety side or the, you know, uh, self-defense side. I, I don't know that people would be buying our products in that relation. You know, I would expect right. them to go to the store and get a gun and it doesn't really matter too much how accurate it is. Right. Uh, you know, they just want to, well, within reason, obviously. Sure. Um, and, and we do sell a fair amount to OEM. So, you know, they could still be buying our product when they buy a rifle off the shelf, right. but our aftermarket sales, uh, you know, I think it's probably more, you know, okay. So now they bought it. It's uh, three months later, the world didn't blow up. Uh, there's no zombies. <laughs> um, I got to do something with this rifle. Let me start browsing online and hopefully have fun, you know, they find some MDT stuff and they do. So we were talking off air here a little bit and you're mentioning something that sounds really exciting. I don't know. Are we able to talk about this on air? Uh, yeah, we'll talk about it. Um, it is kind of funny for me to talk about because I've been keeping this a, uh, kind of somewhat close guarded secret for a few years now, uh, but it's my pet project and we've been referring to it inside of MDT as ET. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and the reason I can talk about it now is because, you know, we were patent pending and I was still a bit com uncomfortable, but we're now at those final stages where testing is going to start happening and people are going to see this product in the marketplace. So ET stands for electronic trigger. Cool. So what, what, uh, the, the story behind that is, uh, several years ago, uh, we knew that, I mean, we make anything that attaches to a precision rifle except for triggers. Mm. So triggers was just, uh, you know, anybody that pays attention to what we're doing would see that as a natural next step. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you know, as I mentioned earlier, when we make something, we want it to be better than anything else out there or, or unique and different in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we were working on a trigger, we spent, we have a full trigger design, mechanical trigger, uh, but we didn't believe that it was necessarily better. Some of the issues that uh, these high precision triggers have is reliability, especially when they're feather light trigger weights. On right. There. And, um, so we wanted something that was more reliable. Uh, we wanted to have something that would somehow lend itself to more accuracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what we ended up doing is, uh, realizing, okay, if we make it electromechanical, what it will do is, uh, it will be a faster lock time. Mm -hmm. It will be more reliable at a higher round count. And then another thing that we did and what we're starting with is, um, the trigger won't move. So we call it the zero stage instead of a single or dual stage. Interesting. It's, it's a, so it doesn't move, but you can program the pressure at which the trigger breaks. Oh, this is interesting. So you can say four ounces, six ounces, 12 ounces, whatever. Uh, don't know exactly how you're going to program it yet, but mm. either it's going to be with, you know, uh, a sequence of trigger pulls or connecting your phone to the trigger, because there mm -hmm. will be a data port at the bottom of that trigger. Okay. And, um, so this trigger should, um, have a faster lock time. Okay. It should be more reliable Yeah. and you should have a higher level of accuracy because it'd be in not, nothing moving. Cause when you, when you click that trigger, I mean, if you look at any, uh, dry fire and you, you look at what you're doing, you are always moving something because it goes click. Right. There's no click here. The only click that happens is the firing pin flying forward. So, uh, you know, do we really know what's going to happen here? I can be very honest with you. We, this, this could end up being not working out. Sure. So we're, we're kind of making ourselves vulnerable with this product development, but I think that that is a very important part of getting to a next level is coming up with something that is risky and yeah. something that might not work. And this is one of those products. Uh, there's going to be, we're going to be looking for beta testers later this year where people are going to be able to try this. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's going to have a lot of testing before this becomes a, uh, product that anybody can buy, uh, more than anything else that we do. 
Um, but um, I'm well. I wouldn't wouldn't be doing it if I didn't believe in it. So. So if somebody was interested in becoming a beta tester, they just go to your website um, or do you already have a cadre of people sort of in mind? Well, we do have, uh, well, we'll be testing ourselves, of course, sure. heavily first. Then we do have uh, a group of uh, sponsored shooters and brand ambassadors that are very close to MDT that mm. already have known about this for a while that it's coming and uh, they would be next on testing this uh, mm -hmm. and that's in hunting environments, that's in competition environments. Um, and then after that, we would probably open it up to more people. And by that time, we'll probably have a way for people to sign up for it. But it's, it, this is not something that somebody is going to have their hands on in the next couple of months. Right. Uh, this is something that, um, is going to be tested extremely thoroughly before Very it's cool. going to be out there. Yeah. I find if you really want to break something. Give it to the general public to test. Yes. <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah. The, the people who know about firearms and are used to firearms will know the happy path, the, the proper way to take the product and use it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and we see that, I mean, you know, 10 years ago we would make something and, uh, there would be a quality issue with it and somebody would call in and say, okay, we'll fix it. Mm -hmm. Today we mess them up and there is a thousand people out there with that issue and it's, uh, a logistical nightmare. Okay. So it, it just makes us having to really push hard on, you know, I mean, not that we wouldn't anyways, but it's vital that what we make is extremely high quality. Well, you used a term, uh, what legendarism yes. was, is that, am I saying it right? Yeah. You're saying it right. Yeah. Um, we, um, well, for many years we used the term shoot better. Mm. Um, that was our, uh, we, and we tried to trademark that, but then there was a trademark issue with it. So we no, no longer use it. Mm. But we always uh, want to have something to basically believe in, rally around. Like when we make a product, why do you make this product? And we always would ask ourselves the question, does it make our customer shoot better? Mm. And we actually still ask that question internally, but, but there's another level to it because we don't want it to just be about the product. We want to uh, be legendary in any way, shape, and form, not just in the firearms world, just, be, just as a company. Mm -hmm. So we push on being legendary uh, with the products that we make, how we deal with our customers. You know, our customers, when they contact us, they get a two-hour response time, which – um, you know, a lot of companies struggle with doing, that's uh, crazy. we try to be legendary with how we deal with our employees, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why we do things like, well, it's one of the reasons we also do the ammo program with them. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, all our employees were gifted a precision rifle. Um, there's, there's just, uh, and, and not just those things, but just, you know, the flexibility that, at which they can work by us. Um, the way we deal with our suppliers, the way we deal with our just everybody. Well, having shot some of your matches, some MDT matches that are put on there, I can attest that your staff genuinely are happy. Your company culture is quite good. You've got a very good group of people working with you, which is not exactly easy in today's climate when it's very difficult, it seems to find passionate quality people to be either employees or coworkers. How do you how do you find these people and then how do you retain them? Yeah. Uh, we put a lot of effort into hiring. Uh, we, we, we interview a fair amount of people that never get hired. Mm. So somebody could have all the qualifications in the world, all the education in the world and be the smartest guy in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that that person fits our culture. Mm -hmm. So we put people through tests, personality tests, uh, lots of different things. And we look if somebody fits our culture. Um, if we don't believe that person fits our, our culture, we've made some very difficult decisions where we knew somebody had wicked skills mm. and, and we won't hire that person. Whereas we can go and find somebody that may need some work on the skills and all that, but they fit the culture well, we'll hire that person and we'll help them with the training or whatever we need to do. So our hiring process is very, uh, robust and, be and it becomes, you know, as the years go by, we become better and better at it. Mm. Um, and when people are working at MDT, we want to make sure that they feel very free. So, you know, we, years ago we would, uh, if we had to let somebody go, people would feel on edge. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I didn't like that, uh, feeling for people. So we implemented something where literally our, our managers cannot fire anybody, uh, unless that person has been written up three times and those write-ups can only happen once a month. So basically nobody has to worry that, Ooh, am I going to get fired tomorrow? It doesn't. 
it cannot it cannot happen. So like all those things, they're all little things, but together it I do believe it makes a great culture at MDT. I, th I think that's actually pretty huge. I've heard some people say that companies spend so much time worrying about hiring when they should actually be spending more time worrying about firing or how they fire somebody. Uh, because, you know, so often it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a relationship that people are in or a, what working with somebody is a working relationship, whatever the relationship is, there's going to be a feeling of, um, rejection and upset and hard feelings when it comes time to split paths but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And if you work at how you do that, like a person can come on and like you say, smartest person in the world, but they just don't fit the company culture. Tell you what, I actually know other businesses that would love your expertise and you'd probably fit in well with their culture. Let me help you transition over there. Or, uh, yeah, I, I think, I think that is a very big part of having a, uh, a, a, transparent company and a successful one. And when people know that process, so they know it's not like they're going to walk into work tomorrow and they messed up and they're going to be gone. No, that's right. We, we, we like to think that, you know, it's kind of, you know, interesting to say for a 10 year old company, but we hire employees for life. We really want them to stick around for life. Uh, so once somebody is at MDT for three months, mm -hmm. we will do everything to keep that person there. Uh, and if it does become apparent that it's not the right person for the job to try to put them in a different position first, and if that doesn't work, we'll, we'll help that person find something else, mm -hmm. but it won't be a blind side ever. It will always be from a light that we want to make sure that that person is set up for success, no matter what they're going to do. That's awesome. So I guess you have a very personal investment yourself with everybody that you're working with there. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, it's very important for me to just have a really great workplace. I, I don't want to, I'm generally a very blunt person. I just kind of say what I think. You're Dutch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Canadian, but yes, I, yes, yeah. I am. Um, I, um, I, I don't want to walk on eggshells around people. And, and they know it, but I also think that with the bluntness and just saying what I think, people don't have to really guess. It's not like, what is he thinking today and all that. Right. There is some people that I know that come working for us or that are intimidated by, by me because I am blunt and I say what I think. Mm. But then after a while, they realize that it's just what you see is what you get and they get comfortable with it. And for some people it's immediate and some people it takes a little while, mm -hmm. but I, I, I think that also contributes to the work environment that we have, where we all just try to reach a goal mm -hmm. and we can just be open with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, from my perspective, I've always looked at myself more as a entrepreneur, a dreamer, somebody who's got ideas, who likes to invent or create different things than a manager. I can manage if I have to. And like you always like to have people on board. I look at them more like a family who are working with me in a working family and would love to have people on board with the company for life. But you gotta, the hard part is realizing that that's not always for everybody. I mean, the natural lifespan of most people working for a company isn't isn't life. Right? No, that's right. And it's going down from what my understanding is, you know, it, 30 years ago, people would work somewhere for, you know, 30, 40 years. Whereas today people are like, eh, you should change every five years or something like that. Right. And, uh, I, I don't, I just don't want it to be that like that. I also think that our environment is challenging enough that people don't get bored, which is a big part of it. You know, mm. so they, you don't come in, you know, 10 years later and, and oh, it's all the same old. That's never the case at MDT. There's always something new going on. We, we rapidly change and adapt and we create new brands and new products and, and, and all of that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we've got to keep challenging each other, keep challenging ourselves, And that's part of the equation as well, I believe. Well, one thing I think is really valuable is you can build a quality product, which is, which is great. It can work very well in and of itself. Uh, but if the end user doesn't know how to use it properly, they're not going to reap the benefits out of that. So you guys have invested a fair bit of time and energy and money into, uh, your social media and your media accounts in training and showing people and testing things out and showing transparently how, how these things are used. And then, you know, the third part of all of that, I think is, um, when we're talking about mental marksmanship earlier, the, well, the Nike effect, people can wear a pair of runners and 
they have another pair of runners that they've got a little Nike symbol on them and they can all of a sudden run faster and jump higher because they believe in what it is that they're, they're actually wearing. And I think you're kind of hitting it from all, all aspects. You're creating something quality. You're showing people how to use it in a proper way and through the legendarism, right? Through the media, through the, um, presentation and how you deal with your clients and customers, you're creating that, that mental aspect to it where people know they've got something that's going to perform well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, when, when, I mean, the brand, that's kind of everything, right? To us. Um, right. So, uh, when people, you know, see something with MDT on it, we, you know, we want them to be able to trust it, of course, mm. and, and, and they do. So that is something that we set out to do a long time ago. Uh, where, you know, back then we used to come up with a new product and people were like, hmm, okay, I'll try it. Whereas today we can come up with something new and people are like, okay, I'm, you know, the first day we'll sell many right. uh, because people will trust in the brand. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, of course that is, you know, from a business aspect, that is, that is what we want. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we do also at the same time want to make sure that, uh, we don't put profits first. Mm. Um, we, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, Laszlo was bought out by a private equity firm in 2017. Mm. I'm, I'm currently in the process of buying them back out. Okay. And the reason for it is we don't want to be this corporate environment where, uh, profit comes first because it simply just flat out does not, no matter what anybody says, if you put profits first, your company's going down. Yes. I, I truly believe that. And, uh, you know, we've made this, some choices and decisions in the past that, that, um, that didn't help us. And, uh, I think it was, you know, a little bit too focused on being profitable mm. and, and, uh, that's not the company that I want. So, uh, we're in the process of buying them back out and we're going to be who we want to be. Good for you. You know, I always look at it like, you know, back in high school, the kids who really want to be popular and they never are. <laughs> right. The kids are out there doing their own thing, enjoying what they like to do. People naturally gravitate towards them and they're the popular kids, but the ones who are chasing the popularity are always going to be behind it. And in the same way, people who are chasing the dollar, who are looking at profit first, that means you're never going to actually be obtaining it. You're always chasing it. It's always in front of you. And in that process, you're not looking at what's really important that kind of got you there. It's like Rockefeller that he was once asked you got so much money. How much money is enough? And he says, just $1 more. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 That's right. We don't want to be like that. No, 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 no. But, but we, like, I still get a kick out of, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll still deal with customers, uh, even some support tickets here and there. I, uh, you know, we get some really big orders at MDT these days that, you know, with what we do with the customers that were larger customers that we have, but I, th I think I still get more enjoyment out of one guy that upgrades his rifle and gets a smile on his face because his accuracy improves or he just loves the way it feels or the way it looks. So, some of our customers never shoot a thing. So, mm. you know, that it's a, it's a safe queen and, um. Uh, we just get a ton of enjoyment out of there. Uh, we get letters from our customers. Uh, sometimes they're read off in our Friday morning meetings. We have a stand-up meeting with all our staff on Friday mornings. Yeah. And, um, you know, sometimes one of our customer support staff will read out, read off a letter from a customer, just how he is so happy that he got a fast response and he was taken care of and this and that. And, and those are the things that, that really give us just a lot of joy. Well, if you're going to innovate. You can't expect to make advancements without slipping every once in a while. You can't expect to run fast without having to slow down and, and kind of catch your breath a bit. When mistakes do happen or yeah. there is a slip, how do you guys deal with it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we just got to be very open about it. And these mistakes certainly do happen. One that's fresh on my mind currently is, uh, in 2000, just this January, we had to do a price increase okay. and, uh, you know, it's tough to do price increases. We generally don't, but you know, I think everybody currently understands how much, uh, supply chain costs have gone up. Mm. If you look at the aluminum index, that's gone way up just in the last bit. And we use a lot of aluminum. Uh, I think we're BC's largest billet aluminum user. Really? Yeah. Something yeah, crazy. I've been told that if I yeah. don't know how true it is. Um, but, uh, so what we did is like, okay, well, we have to put it on the website, you know, that the price is going to go up. So how do we do this? Okay. Well, how about we put the price on the website of what the new price is going to be, but still allow people to buy at the old price for November and December. Smart. 
thought, okay, well, that was a good idea. So we put it on the website. So we crossed out what the new price is going to be and then showed the old price. And next thing you know, there's a thread on Reddit where it's like MDT is showing fake prices to make that product sound like a sale. Like, oh, <sighs> crap. Come Didn't on. see that coming. <laughs> and, but, but, but they were right. That's exactly how it looked. Sure. And uh, some people are extremely upset with us over that. And, uh, you know, how do you deal with that? Own up to it. Like, don't, you know, it, it's, you know, and some people are still not going to believe us. And I, I I think that the people, that those people don't really know who we really are. Mm. Uh, but the majority of people that know us, like, you know, yes, they realize they screwed up and, and they're fixing it. So we fixed it right away. But yeah. it hurts, man. It, it hurts. And, and that's such a small thing. And the fact that you take that to heart like that. Oh yeah, it's tough. I mean, I'm on that personally answering people uh, on the M- on the MDT account because I it's, see that I it's see- it's uh, it it eats me alive. It's I just I can't <laughs> handle it. <laughs> That's the the life of a business owner. I mean, it's not a nine to five job. You no, can, it's not. You can no. joke around and say you can take off whenever you want, and you can, but you don't. And you're thinking about it, and even when you're out doing something else in the back of your head, you're thinking about the business and your coworkers and yeah. Yeah, and that I mean, it's I mean, it's our life. I mean, I asked my wife uh, when uh, when I started the process of buying out at uh, the, our private equity partner. I said, you know, we're basically going to risk everything here, and she says, well, MDT is our life anyway. My wife is, you know, she she's us shipping at MDT, so you know, she's deep in it as well. Right. Uh, two of our kids are are involved as well in in uh, on the manufacturing side. Wow. Um, so it's uh, yeah, MDT is our life. From the firearms industry in general, you guys have a very smart business model. Uh, firearms are heavily regulated. Firearms accessories aren't necessarily as regulated. Uh, they've got a lot more leeway in, in there. With how things are moving forward in Canada, with the restrictions that are coming in place, does that give you a heartburn at night? Is that something that uh, uh, sits in the back of your head as a big question mark? Well, well, yes and no. So there is um, th- there is a divide there of my personal opinion and my business mm. opinion. So from a business perspective, uh, it does give me concern, but it gives me long term concern because mm. uh, when you can take a few steps like this in the wrong direction in 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 our freedom in mm-hmm. this country, uh, it is uh, concerning and it will affect the business long term for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, On a personal level, you know, I got this beautiful AR sitting in my safe. Uh, I like shooting them. Um, I, you know, I, I just think it's, um, yeah, it is a big question mark in my mind. And uh, even though MDT doesn't really make much for the uh, world of all the rifles that were banned, Mm. I, I would, I would flip this back in a heartbeat because I think this is terrible for our freedoms. I agree. I've been asked, like many others, to um, to assist the courts as a subject matter expert in regards to some of these uh, OIC challenges. I noticed that there was, I think, on the 9th, so uh, what is it today? The 10th. So yesterday, <laughs> yesterday there was an announcement that came out that will most likely be contested, but the, uh, uh, the courts had said that the government has to um, detail the algorithm they use for the prohibitions. And when you talk about the freedoms and the, um, the, the threat against freedom, I think that's the scariest thing out of all of it. Cause that was one of the things that I brought up in my affidavits and in cross essentially was how do they define what a variant is and how do they define what a modified version of is having that framework of definition would be very useful for them so that they can clearly articulate why something's going to be prohibited or not, as well as for the end user. So they can say, ah, I see why I can't get this. I don't agree with the rules, but these are the rules and, and it meets the rules. The difficult part in all of that is that question mark and the reluctance it would seem for the federal government to want to articulate that, which leaves it open for them to expand on that. And I think from a business owner perspective, that might be one of the, the scariest prospects if I were to put myself into your shoes is what areas of expansion could these things be moved into? And like when we talk about an electronic trigger, which sounds absolutely amazing, would that be something that all of a sudden 
meets either provincial regulatory uh, restrictions because they've uh, last year, the year before, they brought in new restrictions in uh, BC, anyways, on uh, electronic devices when um, when hunting. I think basically in response to uh, tracking point, yeah. you, you use their stuff, yeah, yeah for, for stuff for stuff like that, and. Uh, and then from the federal side, are they going to turn around and say, well, that can, like a paintball trigger can be modified to fire more than one shot. Yeah. So I'm sure these are things that have gone through the back of your head. Yeah. Oh yeah. These things are always playing in, uh, what we do. Um, you know, I think it's very important that, uh, we are very, so we're dealing with ignorance mm. you know, on, on the other side and uh, it gets a lot of people very frustrated and rightfully so, but they also lash out about it verbally and online. And I think that that is the wrong approach. Mm. I think what we need to be doing is like, you know, one of, what I would love to be able to do and people might not, might not like this, but I would love to be able to take somebody like, I'm just going to take it to an extreme, Justin Trudeau out to the range, let's go shooting and let them show how much fun you can have with this <laughs> and have him be less intimidated by this and kind of really, if he were to really understand the shooting community, he would look at this different or Bill Blair or somebody like mm -hmm. that, you know, like, um, but we can do that in a miniature version, I think, uh, you know, it's just somebody that we know, maybe we have a re really left-wing friend or something like that. Mm -hmm. Take him out to the range shooting and, and, and show him what a great time it is. I have never... I've taken a lot of people shooting that had never shot before, mm -hmm. and I've never taken somebody that said, oh, I really hated it. Never. Right. And and I think that just about anybody that does the same would probably say the same thing. So you can only really attribute this to ignorance then, if that's the case. You know, yeah. yeah they say never ascribe malice to what can be explained by ignorance, right? Um, but I have a feeling that Justin Trudeau probably likes to shoot guns if given the opportunity, if he's ever done it. Um, Bill Blair, I mean, probably the same thing and whoever is in his shoes now. But I, I remember when I was, uh, sitting in on just the local city council here and they're looking at bringing in restrictions for firearms businesses in the corporation of Delta, now the city of Delta. And I had all of my points set up and I'm get up and it's my turn to talk and I'm going through it. And finally, one of the guys from this city, um, nice guy, I, he says, Travis, Travis, hold on. Do you have much more of this? I said, yeah, I got a whole bunch. He's like, okay, I'm going to stop you right here. I'm going to tell you, I agree with everything you're saying. Everything you say makes sense, but we're not in the business of making sense. We're in the business of doing what we think our constituents want and that sort of, uh, local government level honesty. I, I didn't know what to say. I'm like, oh, okay. I, I don't know how to combat that. So from your perspective of saying, Hey, I'd love to take out Justin, but what we're doing is let's take out a family member. Let's take out a friend. I think that's a much more powerful tool because my thinking is, is that the current liberal government could care less about firearms and banning them. I think it's more about just creating a position that they can force their opposition into and say, oh, look at how bad these guys are. Cause they want to, they want to have guns running around everywhere. It's more just for political points. But if they knew that the general public was like, we can see past this gun owners, non-gun owners, we all want the same thing. We want people to use them responsibly and not illegally. So by the social media stuff that you're doing, by the fun environment from the products you're putting out, I think you're speaking to a wider range group than just the diehard gun owners. You're, you're speaking to the people who are like, Hey, that looks like a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that neat hobby. Yeah, exactly. Those are that, and we should all be doing that. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, you talked about Reddit and of course in Canada, anyone listening in Canada, there's another website out there. It's been pretty popular for a lot of time, which can have a lot of, uh, uh, opinionated people on, on there as well. How do you deal with these, uh, when the internet haters come up, is that something that I, I've seen most businesses have to deal with it to some degree or another? Yeah. We don't have much of it. Um, but of course it, it happens. Um, we are, we're just transparent and honest and we say just the way it is. We don't hide stuff. Um, we don't talk negatively. Um, and that is that even, even inside of our office, our customer support staff get really weird phone calls sometimes where, uh, we are accused of something that makes no sense. 
Mm. And the tendency for any human being would be when the phone call is finished to say something negative about that person. Right. And, and we, don't, we, don't, we don't do that at MDT, even though it doesn't, it would never go outside to the outside world anyway. Right. Uh, that is still somebody that uh, has been in contact with MDT. We want him to have a positive experience with mm. what we're doing. Uh, maybe he went through a hard time himself. Like there's so many reasons why uh, something can be negative and uh, we just won't participate in that side of things. And um, it's it's I don't it's kind of a business policy. We don't really we're not really a strict rule company. Like we don't have all these policies and rules you got to mm. adhere by because I don't like that kind of environment. Right. Um, but people are people know that we don't uh, go talk a negative. And sometimes we do, and mm. we don't mean to. Yeah. And then we need to have an environment where people can say to anybody, including to me, but hey, remember we don't talk like that. Right. That's the environment we want because we're all going to screw up, but we should all make sure that we are there to hold each other accountable. You know, that's extremely refreshing to hear and very, very positive to hear because particularly in an industry that is constantly under fire, pardon the pun, it can be very easy for people to take a bit more of a negative approach. And I see a lot of people within the industry taking, taking that negativity on and having a difficult time sorting through it. And that's part of the reason why I started the silver core podcast is to meet other positive people within the industry and to share their passion with others. That, that, that level of, uh, basically the buck stops here, the negativity comes and we're going to do everything we can just to sort it out and put positivity forward, I think is going to serve the outdoors community, the hunting, the fishing, the firearms community far more than any griping or complaining or rallying ever will. Oh yeah. No, a hundred percent. Yeah. How, how many things have uh, been positive, positively been impacted by somebody complaining a lot, you know? <laughs> That's right. That's totally. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you're going to complain, have a solution and find a way to end that in a positive way. I'm really sick and tired of receiving calls from customers and they're complaining about ABC. Well, maybe we take a look. Do they have a point? Mm -hmm. Is there complaint? Is, is there any validity to this? And if so, rather than screening out all of those customers, why don't we just fix what they're complaining about? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, TELUS a long time ago, uh, maybe it was BC TEL and then TELUS came in and it used to be cell phones are dropping calls all the time. And if you called up and you got mad at them and you told them where the call was and they would reimburse your call or they'd reimburse a month of your, your bill. And, but it was a process and everyone knew it. You'd had to call up, get mad, ask to speak to a supervisor. And I remember one time calling up and I'm talking to the agent. I'm like, so do I got to call in and get mad here? And like, like everyone says, I'd speak to a supervisor. Can we just sort this out? Right. And, and the agent says, well, actually funny, you mentioned that we've just had a company wide meeting and we are changing or getting rid of our customers who call and complain like that. If you approach us in a reasonable fashion, we will bend over backwards to help you in a reasonable way because they found they had built their own company culture up to a point where they've trained all of the customers to be extremely negative to them in order to get what they want. So I thought that was kind of an interesting pivot that they made. And she just came straight out and told me, says, yeah, no, anybody's going to call up and complain. We we're just going to say, thanks. It was great having you as a customer. Go check out one of our competitors. Yeah. I, I love that. It actually makes me think of, um, this may be kind of a controversial thing to some people, but, uh, Starbucks versus Tim Hortons. Okay. I don't go to Tim Hortons anymore. I used to a lot. Yeah. But when I go to Tim Hortons, I get a grumpy, I get a grumpy person generally, or mm -hmm. I just, it's just kind of, you know, whatever, order your coffee and get out of here. Right. You go to Starbucks. And, uh, you get a, you get somebody that is very excited <laughs> to meet you and yes. to uh, give you a coffee. And I, I pay a lot of attention to how businesses are. And I try to poke at like, what, what kind of training do you guys get? And I think it's actually my brother that asked somebody at, uh, uh Starbucks of, um, you know, like, w what are they telling you trainers? You guys are so different than Tim Hortons. And they said, well, we always make the situation right. And they have those kinds of things. And, and, uh. You know, I think that's, that's the difference between the positive and the negative experience. 
Well, where did you learn this? I mean, you were working in greenhouses before, right? I, like, ha- I did work in greenhouses like a long a time ago. Yeah. <laughs> good Dutchman, I tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now you moved your way through and you're doing sales and like, where did you learn how to run a company of this size to, like yeah. this? Well, uh, first of all, I haven't learned yet. I'm still learning. <laughs> good answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, um, I don't really know how to answer it well because I don't, uh, I don't have a high school diploma. I don't have any schooling really. I have done different kinds of education. Like for example, I've taken APEX courses, it's opera, you know, associations for operations management and those kinds of things. Um, I, uh, I have failed a lot. Mm. So I, you know, since I was, uh, I got married at 19, so I got married young. Uh, I've always been trying different businesses. So MDT wasn't the first time I got involved with business. Um, I, I, I have learned much more from failure than the other side. So, you know, with, with the success that we have, there's a lot of painful failure. Yeah. Nothing, nothing really teaches lessons like lumps, Hey. Yeah, for sure. You know, just even an example, even at a company where I worked, they would pay their suppliers, uh, at about 90 or 120 days and you, we would often deal with our account to be on hold when we needed to buy something and it would hurt production. Mm. And, uh, I never, ever wanted to be in an environment like that with my own company. So we pay weekly, you know, we just do the entire pay run every week and, and people are happy to deal with us because, um, uh, they know they're going to get paid and it makes everything so much easier. And again, you know, going back to being a legendary company, it's, it's, it's what we just look at everything that we do and say, how can we make this the best possible? Um, there's a, there's a lot of trial and error in that. And there's a lot of things we don't have figured out yet. And there's a long way to go yet, but, uh, it, it's what makes the path of what's next so much, so enjoyable for everybody at the company, because we all know that that thing that's not working well right now mm. is only going to be a short period of time because we will not, we're relentless about legendarism. I love it. So what's next in the future? What do you see as the next big thing for MDT? Um, we are, uh, you know, well, currently we have eight designers and engineers working on new products. So new product development is always going to be huge for what we do. As a matter of fact, we have another eight new hires scheduled for 2022 in the engineering department. Wow. Um, we are, um, doing more in different materials. So, you know, we started out doing a lot of aluminum machining. Mm. Uh, then we started introducing polymers. So, uh, we own our own injection molding company. It's called Radical Composites, which is owned directly by MDT. And that's kind of how we like to set things up because Very Radical cool. Composites, Radical Composites can go to the bank and get a lease mm. for a loan, but MDT cannot. Right. Um, just because of the, the space that it's in. Um, we also recently started a company called Audacity Manufacturing, and that's actually doing woodworking. So, uh, a laminate oh. stock is going to be, it's, it's semi-released already. It's people, some people have seen it out in the wild here and there being tested. Uh, but that's going to be released here soon. Uh, we are working hard on making sure that we have multiple spectrums that are getting attention. So the MDT side is going to grow, uh, with all those products, but we also have our Oryx brand, which, uh, is more of an entry level and that's going to start seeing some new products. So, you know, for example, uh, you know, MDT just released or is in the works of, uh, officially releasing a new bipod very soon, which is going to be about a $200 bipod, uh, $200 us that is. Yeah. Um, and Oryx will probably see some similar, but more at an entry level price. So at $200 is a good price, that's for, a great price. For, for the kind of products that MDT makes, yeah. but Oryx needs to have something that's more like in the hundred dollar range. So right. those are the kind of things that we, uh, work on. Um, so it, we're very, very product focused. Uh, we will expand while we'll, well, we're working on a new building right now. So, uh, on the, uh, MDT side where we do our distribution and our, uh, services, we're moving into a 30,000 square foot building in a couple of months mm. uh, on the manufacturing side, we're working on building a 110,000 square foot building also in Chilliwack. And we will probably also be looking at, at expanding our U.S. operations. So right now it's just warehousing, but we'll be doing, well, we're doing some manufacturing in the U.S. already, but we're ex- looking to expand that as well. Very smart. 
Well, when we talked earlier, we're talking about breaking this into two sections. One where we get some background, we learn all about what MDT is about. And the second part, the second section, we get into some of more the technical aspects of how your products work and why, and some of the decision-making process behind it. Before we jump into that second part, which I'm going to have available separately, um, is there anything else we should be talking about on this? Um, there's probably lots, um, you know, I can talk about MDT forever. Um. What about the TV show? Wasn't there a TV show that, uh, you just recently did? Uh, yeah. So this morning, actually just this morning, yeah, I talked to, uh, Rod Gatelka from, uh, the CCFR. Okay. Um, so, um, that was a, just, it's a short, uh, interview, some similar questions that's going to air next week on wild TV. Okay. So I think that when this podcast airs, that probably will have already uh, it's so that's so basically it will be last week. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Last week. Yeah. But it will be available. It will probably re-air a bunch of times, but it is going to be, it's a series for a CCFR. Mm. Um, so definitely tune into that because it's not, that, that show is not about, you know, me coming on the show. It's about all the good that Rod is doing there and, mm. uh, in the, in the landscape that we're working on in the firearms industry. So, um, yeah, check that out. Okay. Well, Martin, thank you very much for coming on the Silver Core podcast. It was an absolute blast talking with you and I'm really looking forward to talking about the next section. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. 